So why are we going to do a course in data visualization at all? Um, you know, we're really good at collecting data. We have lots and lots of data uh, that we collect every day. We know what the weather is going to be like in every city in the world today. We know um, stock prices within moments of them happening. Um, the reality is, is that when you're talking about single data points, which is what is today's temperature, what is today's stock price, um, we can interpret that quite well. But when we talk about large groups of data or interrelationships between multiple data points, the brain is not good at processing that just from looking at numbers and looking at the actual data. In fact, the human brain is programmed specifically to deal with interrelationships visually. All right? The sheer scale of data today makes understanding very, very difficult without help. Right? We've probably all seen this quote from John Naisbitt, we're drowning in information, but we're starved for knowledge. Uh, we can't even create information, um, humans, without huge amounts of technology taking this data, turning it into something that has structure and context, and making us understand things. You're going to be doing all kinds of data analysis, no matter what your focus is, as a manager, or as an analyst, or the people who work for you, Every job is a data job now. And being able to present the results of your data analysis and be able to present what your data says is something that takes more than just producing a bunch of numbers, all right? And the key to illustrating what is going on with your data is to answer the question compared to what. I am going to come back to this over and over and over again in the course you may produce the most lovely visualization that accurately shows what your data shows and get a C. Because you're not providing anything in that visualization for me to understand whether or not those numbers that you're producing are good, bad, or indifferent. For instance, what do these numbers mean? 98.6, 32, 911, 451. 70.6. Well, obviously, these numbers mean things to people. Just by definition, we oh, 98.6. He must be talking about human temperature. Well, maybe I'm not. And if it's human temperature, we for 98.6, we might be talking about human temperature. And we know that 98.6 is quote-unquote normal because we've been taught the guideline that 98.6 is normal. But if 98.6 was a stock price, how would you know if that number was good or bad? you'd have to be comparing it to something else. The same thing with any of these numbers, 451. Oh, that's the temperature that paper burns. Well, maybe it's Google's price today. And if it were Google's price today, it wouldn't be necessarily a very good number. So how do we know that if the level of a number is good or bad? We use annotation and all kinds of other techniques that we're gonna talk about in this class to make sure that we don't just present the numbers we present the numbers with structure and context that allows people to see those numbers and evaluate them as being good, bad, or um, you know, average, whatever we, we, we want to communicate by providing other visual indicators. Humans are hardwired to make comparisons visually, but not number by by comparing a large number of numbers. So we actually have access to tools now that people couldn't would never have believed that would be available hundreds of years ago. Um, this is a really re recent development. They've, we've used tables. They found tables as, as early as about the first century. But graphical representations only started about 300 years ago. And now, with technology, we no longer need an artist to draw graphical representations all of us can create really bad charts in Excel or any other tools that we're using with just a few clicks. So the way that a course is going to work is we're first, well, first, it's kind of, they're, they're, let me say, the first part of the course will be more heavy on this first co component, and the second part of the course will be more heavy on the second component, but we're going to be doing both all along. The first side of the course is this idea of understanding how humans perceive. So we're going to look at theories of visual perception, 
theories of visualization design that work with the way humans perceive, and learning how to match the right visualization to the right data and the right story that we're trying to tell. We're going to be using Tableau to do that, so the further into the course we go, the more advanced things that we're going to be looking at at Tableau, and we're going to be saying, okay, well, how could this advanced feature in Tableau be used to provide more context, more of that compared to what question, so that a person who looks at this data will have excellent ability to interpret that data very quickly uh, using pre almost precognitive processes. And it's really true that a picture can be worth a thousand words. We can use color, placement, size, and other attributes, and we can do that in a way that humans interpret them merely intuitively. If we misuse those things, we can really um, hinder a person's ability to perceive and even create lies. And one of my key goals for this course is that you will never intent, unintentionally or intentionally lie with your data by just not understanding what you're doing while you visualize. Now Tableau is going to make it hard to mistakenly lie. In fact, you really have to work hard to make your data lie using Tableau. But the other side of that is I want you to become great consumers of visualization and understand when you're being lied to in the visualization. Okay? So we're going to learn how to use color, placement, size, etc. Let's look at this example. Look at this, this chart. This is actually a chart created and published. Let me ask you, does, is this chart in any way using color or placement or size to help you make meaning of these numbers? I'm going to have you pause the video right now and take a look at this and evaluate for me how you think the use of color, size, placement is being used to help you perceive the story of these numbers. Okay, I assume that you paused the video at that point and took a look. And most likely what you're saying is, huh, was the size, placement, color use, useful to help me understand? Probably not. You might be noticing that 13% use yellow. Well, okay, it's yellow, so I know that it's talking about yellow, but I also knew what yellow was before this circle was there. But the real problem here is 13% is much larger than 33%, which seems to be the smallest of all four of these. Also, there's always someone in every, in every course who says, these don't all add up to 100. And th that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue because what it's actually showing is multiple parts to whole at once. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. But the idea here is that none of this, of this visualization provides any more meaning than simply of having a data table or just the text would have given us. We will not make visualizations like this. We will use visualization intentionally to help our users and our viewers make more um, intuitive cognitive evaluations. So visualization is something that you've been being programmed to use since you were a little child. You know much of what you know about the world based upon what your eyes have seen and how you have seen the outcome of what your eyes have seen. There's a reason that you think up means more. We'll talk about that next time. There's a reason why um, you understand things that are the same length to be the same in some way. Okay, we'll talk about that next time. And because your brain has, was, is designed and programmed to interpret things visually, um, not to look at large numbers of data presented in tables. We're going to look at a very um, famous example. This is from the early 1970s. And in the early 1970s, there were some people who were saying we shouldn't visualize data because it's imprecise. 
we should just be showing statistical summaries of data because they are far more precise. And a man named Anscombe took some exception to that, and he produced this set of numbers. Let's take a look. There are four groups of xy coordinates. Um, we can think of plotting them on, on an xy graph and take a few moments to decide what's kind of the same and what's different amongst these four groups of data. The first thing most groups notice is that, huh, the x and y, the x coordinates for groups 1, 2, and 3 are all the same set of numbers. Now the reason that that is easy to perceive in these tables is because they're all in the same order. If they were all in a different random order, people would not easily pick up on that. Uh, but most groups, when they look at this, kind of say, huh, 1, 2, and 3 are more alike than 4. 4 is kind of out there by itself, and it's got something weird where all the x's are the same, and there's this weird 19. And most people start to say, well, 1, 2, and 3 are more, you know, they kind of start picking through the numbers, and often you might say that maybe 1 is kind of linear, and 4 is kind of just random. Uh, but what most people don't notice is that all four sets of these data are statistically identical. Now I'll go back to that in a second because I want to make you kind of forget those numbers <laughs> just a little bit. And what William Playfair, who's kind of the father of visual uh, representation of quantitative data, said is that you can read his quote here, but the point is, is that he's saying if one looks at a table and really studies it, even after just a few moments, you forget it. Right? But I love the way he writes, and I wish we all still wrote and communicated this way. Like a figure imprinted on sand, it is soon totally erased and defaced. And that's really true. If I look at a set of numbers, um, it's easy for me to forget them after just a few, few minutes. So he said, hey, we need to start looking and, uh, at presenting data graphically. And he actually developed many of the charts that we currently use. He developed the pie chart. He, this is an interesting um, line chart um, with cumulative differences, kind of a, um, showing this balance of exports and imports between Denmark and Norway to England. Um, a uh, stacked area chart that we use, column charts. These are all column charts with a trend. These are all things that we have built in our lives. But going back to Anscombe's Quartet, I'm going to tell you that all four of these things are statistically identical. And you're going to say, Dr. Tripp, you're insane. But all of them had an N of 11. All groups had a mean of X of 9 and a mean of Y of 7.5. All the groups had the same exact regression line. So the people who were arguing that precision is important well, the problem is all four of those data sets come up with the same exact regression line, the same residual sum of squares, the same correlation coefficient, and the same variance explained. And so if you graph that, and you're going to say those four groups of data all look like this. Well, probably we, we're already kind of getting a little queasy about that because we know that those, that those sets of data looked pretty different. So let's look at each one individually. Group one actually kind of looks like it fits that line. So if, you, if you've taken your regression class, you should know that, yeah, well, this line that goes kind of through here, there's kind of the same number of dots above and below it, and you see that they're kind of inner, they're kind of kind of equivalent distances from the line on both sides. So that one looks pretty good, like a pretty good fit. But here's what group two looks like when you plot it visually. Here's what group three looks like when you plot it visually. And here's what group four looks like when you plot it visually. And if you were to walk in to a meeting and say, these are our four quadrants of customers or our four categories of customer, and we tell our management that they all look like that, well, we're not going to do real well. Group one kind of looks like that, and group two might even look like that. But if we're going to go into, into, into our management and say, 
we can reach all four of these groups with the same strategy. They're all going to behave the same way because our regression lines are all the same. We're going to be in trouble. The world does not look like this. The world looks a lot more like this. And, in the, and with more and more data, we're going to be able to micro-segment even more our customers. Obviously, we have one-on-one -on -one marketing now, which is incredibly, um, incredibly powerful. But we still do this micro-segmentation. And visualization is going to help us illustrate the differences between our segments. So that was a really simple example. There were only 11 data cases. It was a big font, so it was easily readable. But there's a really low likelihood that a person would realize the big differences between the different data sets, except, of course, for groups four. Group four tends to say, uh, it tends to be, that one's different than the other three. But most people don't pick up on the idea that what the specific nuance of each of the sets of data is, etc. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and make the argument that, at least in some cases, data visualization is a matter of life and death. So in 1986, a disaster was caused by poor data visualization, if you believe some. And the video is here at this link here, but I'm going to show it right now. That same aerospace industry that could so inspire the people of Earth shattered our confidence and broke our hearts in an instant on January 28, 1986. Few who watched the Challenger disaster live will ever forget that moment as the magnificent ship exploded and dropped into the sea. In the weeks that followed, sorrow turned to rage as the true causes of the disaster became known. The immediate cause was a white-hot flame that burned through the side of a rocket motor. A puff of smoke is visible here as the burn-through begins. Only seconds later in the flight, the hot flare is clearly visible, burning through the side of the rocket motor. Like a blowtorch, the flare burned through the main fuel tank, igniting the liquid oxygen and hydrogen inside in a spectacular explosion. The flare had started at a joint in the rocket motor, joint sealed with rubber O-rings. NASA and its contractors had evidence that the rocket motor O-rings could fail below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. But NASA had already launched shuttles below 53 degrees and gotten away with it. Just because you got lucky doesn't mean the risk is reduced. And sure enough, the risks were still there and the statistics caught up with them. On January 28, 1986, NASA decided to go ahead with a shuttle launch at only 36 degrees. There was solid ice all over the launch pad. Engineers involved with the O-rings did everything they could to stop the launch. On the fourth or fifth time, they pushed the envelope. Sure enough, almost exactly at you know the temperatures they said those o-rings blew apart and the tragedy of that is that besides the, the the tragic souls lost on the challenger themselves there were people on the ground who warned about it who were so upset about it and who to this day are you know destroyed because they you know knew about it tried to warn and they were dismissed okay so the engineers did everything they could to try to stop the launch but they couldn't Now, if they did that, why would the administrators still launch? If they said, look, this is going to blow up, it's going to fail, and NASA still went ahead and launched, and they had the disaster, why would they have done that? Now, there's some evidence that poor data visualization led to poor decision-making on the day of the Challenger explosion. Basically, the idea here is that although there was plenty of data that would show that the O-rings would fail, the engineers were unable to put together a compelling argument to management to say this is what the data shows. So what exactly was the problem? If you watch the video, you know that it was a cold-induced failure of rubber O-rings. We all know that when things are made out of rubber, the colder they get, the less resilient they get. Uh, that they get harder, and so they don't, they don't, um, they aren't able to seal as well. And the Morton Thiokol engineers recommended against the launch, but management said, now we're going ahead anyway. 
So it was the 25th launch in the space shuttle program. It was 36 degrees Fahrenheit. It was in January. There were seven astronauts. And many of you are probably too young to recognize this face. This is Krista McAuliffe. She was the first school teacher in space. And so there was a lot of visibility and a lot of attention on this launch. Pay, remember that. So, and this was the first no launch recommendation in the history of the shuttle program. So it's not like engineers were constantly saying, don't launch, don't launch, and being proven wrong. In fact, this was the first time they'd ever said, don't launch. So there's some explanations about this. Statisticians say it demonstrates the importance of risk assessment and fitting statistical models, although there's some problems with that argument in that they didn't have any data for this range of uh, temperatures. Sociologists, it's a conformity to organizational norms problem. Management schools say, yes, it's a case for reflection about groupthink and failures to communicate and politics. And of course, the engineers say it's the awful consequences when heroic engineers are ignored by villainous, pointy-haired bosses. But the first 24 launches were successful, and the proximate cause seems to be that there was an inability for those engineers to convincingly draw a link between temperatures and O-ring failures. So that's what we're trying to, they were trying to communicate. When temperatures go down, O-ring failures go up. So this is Roger Bolgerly. He was the guy in charge, and he knew everything there was to know about O-rings and O-ring failure. And he knew that there was a history of O-ring failure during cold weather. He knows about the physics of resiliency. And they had some experimental data that had to do with O-ring failure at very low temperature. But the problem was that they made a presentation that had 13 slides. And the 13 slides are attached to this deck. And the reality is, is that they had 13 slides. And they're trying to show, again, the relationship between cold and O-ring failure. Six of the 13 slides said no, had no information about either of those things, data about temperature or O-ring damage. Six slides contained information about temperature or O-ring damage, but not the relationship between them. Only one slide had any information about the um, information about the relationship between them. Now, we have to give them a little bit of a break. This is pre-PowerPoint, pre-Excel, pre-Word, where you could just slap together a, a document with all kinds of information from all kinds of different sources in a few minutes. This is the days of having to go to paper binders on shelves and put things together and mimeograph things and Xerox things um, to, to share. So we give them a little bit of a break. But let's take a look at this part of the, uh, part of the data. They produced this data, they presented this data, and what is the relationship that this data is showing? Is it showing the relationship between temperature and O-ring failures? Hopefully you say no. It's really just showing temperature and O-ring failures based upon order of flight. And if you're a manager under a huge amount of pressure because there's this, this school teacher in space, which rows are you probably going to be focusing the most on? I would argue that if I'm a manager trying to figure out any way to, to tell, to, for me to say, you know, I just don't buy what the engineers are saying, is I'm probably going to look at row number 22, where there's two failures, 70, sorry, row number two, where it's 70 degrees and one failure, 22 where it's 75 and two failures, and then look at all these lower temperatures and say, no, there's no failures at all on all these launches that are below here. Yeah, 53, three, three failures, but there's also three failures above 70 degrees. Could you, but the real question is, if you were given data that looked like this, could you make a decision? And I think not. I think most people would say, no, this is not enough information to make a decision. But what if we sorted the data differently? Well, you can make better sense of this because you do see that it does seem like that the failures do start to cluster up here, but they're also way down here as well. I've sorted by temperature now, and I see that when the temperature is lower, there's more failures. But I'm still, as a manager, gravitating toward this saying, well, you know, you're saying there's six failures under 65 degrees, and there's four failures over 70 degrees. I'm not sure that's enough of a correlation for me to, to, to cancel this launch, which we've already postponed multiple times, and the president is on the line waiting to talk to the astronauts once they're into space. 
So maybe something visual. Now here's what Excel would put would, would kick out by default if you just put that data in there. And yeah, I see that it's, the highest is here, but these peaks here are making me kind of confused. It's looking like it's kind of a U shape. Maybe the line is the problem, and maybe I should just use points. Still kind of gravitating towards these out here. But we do kind of see this trend. We could re run a regression, and again, this is what Excel would show if I just put in regression line against the data. The real problem is out here over 80 degrees, I would have negative failures. That's that problem with statistical um, fitting. Once we're outside the um, area of, of, our, of our measurement, we start getting a little bit weird. Tufty, who you're going to read next week, had this as a, as a better solution, mainly trying to annotate the idea that, yes, there are more failures out here when it gets colder, and we're way out here. And then I would think that an engineer might overlay a curve about the physics of resiliency and show that, you know, the curve is way above the top of the screen at this point as far as loss of resiliency. And maybe that might have been more compelling. But the reality is, is that engineers could make not make a compelling argument about what their data said. And as a data analyst or as a manager, you have to have an understanding of what perception says. And that 70% of human perception is visual. And that as we look at things, our brain is making evaluations. We must present compelling visual evidence, even if we are there to, to speak about what the evidence says. Human perception is not a recording of what's actually there, which is something we're going to get into next week. But the idea here is that in order to make a compelling argument about what your data says, you sure you're going to say things, you're going to write things, but you have to also visualize them in a compelling way. And the engineers, when you look at the slides that are in the appendix, you will agree did not make a compelling argument. And for the remainder of this class, what we're going to be trying to do is understand human perception, understand different visualization techniques that we have available to us, and how we can use those techniques in harmony with human perception in order to compellingly illustrate to people what our data says happened and how we might forecast what will be happening in the future. That's enough for this video. I'll talk to you later.